Uh, it's delightful to see so many people in the AP Calculus community interested in this. Uh, those of you who sent Nicole questions sent some really good ones. Uh, there were lots of uh, grading, uh, scoring issues, questions. And so what I tried to do, I did my best to sort of consolidate these, and uh, I'll present them in sort of question and answer format. And a couple of them I'm really going to expand on because there were lots of questions on two or three topics. So I've, I've got a couple of extra slides there. I'm even going to uh, show you a couple of uh, problems, actual free response questions that apply to some of the questions. And I think that a lot of these questions will actually lend themselves to even more issues. So please do send your questions uh, via chat to Nicole. So here we go. Here's the first one. A lot of people wanted to know about numerical answers and do they need to be simplified on a free response question? Well, the simple answer, the short answer is no. And let me give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, final numerical answers do not need to be simplified. And that's actually in the, in the instructions. And here's a couple of examples. If you take a look at that first one that begins with 3 cubed divided by 3, suppose that's a final numerical answer. Let's just suppose that's the result of some sort of definite integral. Even though there's some cancellation in there, even though some of those terms are actually zero, the student does not have to simplify that to receive full credit for the answer. So one issue is that if the student goes on to simplify, and makes a mistake, then they will lose credit for that answer. So take a look at the next one that begins with a sine of zero plus a cosine of pi over two. That's another example, let's say, of a final numerical answer. Even though we can do a lot of simplifying there, the student doesn't have to on the free response portion of the exam. In the next line down, I have an answer there associated with a differential equation. Let's suppose that a student is solving a separable differential equation. This isn't really a final numerical answer. However, that answer, y equal, when the student solves explicitly for y, that answer on the right-hand side, that equation on the right-hand side, that expression can be simplified, but the student doesn't have to. That's good enough to earn that last point. Now, all of this stuff about simplifying final numerical answers, student doesn't have to on the AP exam. In my class, I just want to remind you, that's not necessarily true. So this is a good example that we grade the AP exam just a little bit differently than maybe you and I would an exam in our classes. This is a good one. I heard this from a couple of people. Are partial or half points ever awarded on the AP free response portion of the exam? And the answer is no. Uh, every free response question is worth nine points. So there are six free response questions. There are 54 total points. And there are actually 54 total points in the multiple choice also. Each multiple choice question is worth 1.2 points. So each part is equally weighted. I'm not sure exactly why each free response question is worth nine points. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult to parse out partial credit and award partial credit. But I think with a fewer points, with only nine points, I really believe that it makes it much fairer and consistent. I think you and I might agree that it would be easier maybe if we had 20 or 40 points for each question. But then I don't think it would be as a consistent, uh, consistently graded. So partial credit is awarded in one point increments. The standard that we use is used to assign partial credit in the event that the student does not get full credit. Is the proportion of calculator active questions going to change? Well, this is an interesting question with the new curriculum framework. Well, in the pre response portion of the exam, uh, we're certainly going to stay with only two calculator active questions. You'll remember that it used to be three. It changed back to two a few years ago. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, it is very difficult to write a good calculator active question. Uh, I, that's no excuse for why we went back to only two pre-response questions. But I think it's going to remain at two for the foreseeable future. The multiple choice portion of the exam is going to change 
slightly in 2000, beginning in 2017. I think there currently are 17 calculator active questions. And in 2017, that's going to change to 15 in 45 minutes. I'm not exactly sure why ETS or the College Board is changing that, but my understanding is that they've done some studies on this and that students just haven't had enough time to complete 17 questions, calculator active questions, in the allotted time. And I also think there was a problem with uh, people who are proctoring the exam and allotting the correct amount of time for calculator active questions. So I guess this just makes it easier for everybody. And I want to remind you that when we say calculator active, a calculator active question means that the student may need to use a calculator. Not necessarily, but they may need one. So this is a good question. How are questions on the free response portion of the exam involving the mean value theorem and the intermediate value theorem score? So I'm going to give you a couple of answers on this, and then I'm going to show you some examples. So generally, questions that involve the MVT or the IVT, generally these are worth two points. In intermediate value theorem problems, we're looking for two things. We want the student to show us the appropriate inequality, and then we want them to give us the correct justification. In mean value theorem problems, we'd like the student to show us the correct, the appropriate quotient, and we want the appropriate justification. So it's sort of one point for the quotient, one point for the justification. And I'm often asked, is it okay for students to use abbreviations? Well, on these two theorems, it is. So if a student writes up by the IVT or by the MVT, we know what they're talking about. Those are well-known theorems and abbreviations in this case are okay. So let me show you a couple of specific examples here. This is from last year's exam. Those of you who have been going back and looking at previous exams may remember this one. Here we have a train that's running back and forth on an east-west track. And its velocity is given by this function v, and we have its velocity at certain times v. So I'm going to focus in on question B, part B. It says, do the data in the table support the conclusion that the train's velocity is minus 100 meters per minute at some time t in that interval? And give a reason for your answer. Well, this is the standard. This is what it looks like. There's the two points on the right. One point for that interval. We're looking for the student to sandwich minus 100 between minus 120 and 40. Do they have to say that those two values are equal to V of 8 and V of 5? Probably not. Could they say just V of 8 and just V of 5? Sure, because that's what's on the right-hand side of the standard. That would be acceptable. And then the second point is for the conclusion, where the student says, therefore, by the intermediate value theorem, there is a time t so that V of T is minus 100. So one question I'm always asked is, well, does the student have to say that this function V is continuous? We're told in the statement of the problem that V is differentiable, that implies continuity. Does the student have to say that? Well, the answer is no. Here's two ways that the student can get that second point. The first way is to simply say, therefore, by the IVT, there is this, some value t in the interval, so the v of t is minus 100. That's one way. If the student does not cite the intermediate value theorem, then they have to make use of continuity. So another way they could get that second point after writing down the interval is to say, since v is continuous, there must be a value t in that interval, so that V of T is minus 100. So they can use the IVT, state the IVT, don't have to say anything about continuity, or tell us about continuity, and you don't have to mention the IVT. Um, we do have a question about that. Okay, go ahead. 
Uh, this question is from Rosie. Do students have to mention that the IVT and MVT say, what the IVT and MVT say, or can they say, oh, I'm sorry, you just answered it, but I did get another question that came through from John. Wouldn't a person first have to show that the IVT can be used by demonstrating the continuity? Yeah, we've talked an awful lot about that at the grading. And what, we're, what we do is we give the student the benefit of the doubt of this one. If the student says to us, look, by the intermediate value theorem, our assumption is that they, they know that the function is continuous on the appropriate interval, and therefore they can use it. That's an excellent question. If we had more points, maybe we would ask for that or want that. But at this point, all they have to do is to say, look, here's the interval, therefore by the IVT, or... Here's the interval by continuity. This is value t. So very good question. Uh, we don't require that they say continuity if they use invoke the IVT. So here's another one. This is from 2013. This is AD3, DC3. This one has to do with the mean value theorem. So here we have a table of values. You may remember this one. This has to do with the coffee maker. It's kind of a large cup of coffee. And in part B, we want to know if there's a time t where the derivative of c is equal to 2. And this one says justify your answer. So here's what the standard look like. Very similar. The first point is we want the student to show us that quotient. And again, they can do that with just capital C, or they could do that with the actual values. And then invoke the mean value theorem. They could say, therefore, by the mean value theorem, there is this value t, so that c prime of t is equal to 2. And it's the same deal here. One point for the quotient, one point for saying by the MVT there is a value of T, or one point for the quotient, and one point for saying because C is continuous, there is a value of T, so that C prime of T is equal to 2. So there's a lot of similarities. We did here. have one more question. <laughs> Sorry, oh, we actually have two more questions. Um, the first is from Sarah. After showing the quotient, is it sufficient to say, thus MVT, thus by MVT, this must be true? If the student gives the quotient, that's one point. And that point is in the bank, unless they make a, a simplification error or something. Okay? We'd probably still give them that point because it's a conceptual idea. And then they can very minimally get that second point by just saying, by the MVT, this is true, we would probably give them that point. I hope they'd write more, but we'd probably give them the point. Without seeing in writing, that's a tough one, but we'd probably give them that. As a follow-up, she asks, do they need to say that is at least one such that, one T such that? No. Or anything like so that? No. Oh, that's, it, it, there's a when we uh, when we prepare the standards for this, we sort of draw this line in the sand, and the line in the sand represents the minimal amount that the student could respond and get full credit. So for that second point, the minimal amount, the minimum that the student could say is probably something like this: yes, by MVT. Now again. We hope they'd say more, and uh, I'm not saying that any student did that, but that's sort of our line in the sand. That's sort of if the student says that absolute minimum, then we would give them the point. Okay. And we had another question from Jeannie. Can students earn the second point without having to explicitly state the interval negative 120 is less than negative 1 is less than 40? Uh, so in this one, no, they've got to come up with some, they have to state an interval. That's the first point. So they've got to give us that interval either symbolically with V or numerically with the minus 120 less than minus 100 less than 40. They have to give us an interval for that first point. If they give us no interval, then they would be, they would not be eligible for the second point. I mean, they wouldn't wouldn't be able to invoke the theorem. Okay. And I got one more question from Daniel. 
can you use the abbreviations IVT and MVT, or should students spell them out? Absolutely. They can use those abbreviations. We know those. They can't use LOL, okay? But we know MVT. Okay? Okay. <laughs> and anyone if you have more questions, just send me a chat. Thank you. All right. This is a this is kind of a long long answer here, uh, but several people asked about this. How are integrand reversals scored in area and volume questions? So we probably we I say at the reading we have probably discussed and argued this. I'm going to say for close to a decade, and I think we finally arrived uh, over the last couple of years at a very consistent and fair way to grade this. And I'll see if I can explain it. Here's the answer, the, the short answer. In an area problem, a reversal is a correct first step. Uh, I don't teach it that way. I don't think many of you teach it that way. If we just think about a traditional function, y equal f of x, y equal g of x, and I want the area bounded by those two curves between a and b, I tell my students, look, you've got to figure out what the high curve is, what the low curve is, and you've got to subtract appropriately. However, there are those that argue, you know what, you don't have to do that. If you know one's high and one's low, just subtract them. And if the answer comes out to be negative, well, you just take the opposite. So the way we approach this, and the first step is that a reversal, for example, if you go y low minus y high, gets the first point. And I'll show you many examples of this in a minute. In a volume problem, if the squared term, or if there is a squared term involved, well, look, f minus g squared is equal to g minus f squared, so there's no issue there. That's mathematically correct. So if a student does it either way, they'll get credit. There is no issue there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at a problem from 2013, and I'm going to focus only on part A. I'm going to look at this area of problem. In this question, we've got a function f and g purposely not labeled on the graph because we wanted the students, we felt the students should know which is which. We've got a region R over there, and we want the student to find the area of that region R in part A. Here's the standard. Pretty typical. We have one point for the integrand. Okay, one point for the integrand. It should be, in my opinion, it should be G minus F because G is the high curve, F is the low curve. Two points for the antiderivative, basically one point for each antiderivative. And then everything else is wrapped up into the answer. So one point for putting everything together, plugging in the upper bound, plugging in the lower bound, and getting a numerical answer. Notice that you don't have to have that final numerical answer, 16 over pi minus 4 thirds, you could leave it in that step right before it, to the left. So this area problem, this one part A, is worth four points. Now, this is a typical sort of a reversal. A student could do this and earn full credit. So I'm not sure whether this is showing up, but the first, in the first line, I have f of x minus g of x in red. So in my class, that would be wrong. But on the AP exam, that's okay. That first line right here on this slide would get one point. That is a correct way to solve this problem. The integrand is correct. I'm not looking at the bounds, the 0 to 2. The 0 to 2 are wrapped up in the answer point. So this student goes all through this, gets the antiderivatives correct, plugs in the lower bound, plugs in the upper bound, and ends up with 4 thirds minus 16 over pi. It recognizes that as negative. That student recognizes that answer as negative and says, oh, I must have had them reversed. And so they write on a separate line that the area is really 16 over pi minus 4 thirds. That is a typical example of what we would call a reversal and a way in which a student would get full credit in this problem, all four points. Now, there's some things that can go wrong here. And it's taken me a while to decipher all of this and get in my mind exactly how this works. But here are some things that can go wrong. 
So what I have at the top of this page... Um, we have a couple questions came in. Okay, go ahead. I don't know if you're going to answer them now. Um, the first question was from Sarah. Are the brackets around G parentheses X minus S parentheses X necessary, or will a point be lost because of a presentation error? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in this case, you pro the student would probably not lose credit for that. In my class, they probably would, but not on the AP exam. Uh, in, on this particular example, it would be pretty clear that F minus G is all in the integrand, and we would certainly look at the next step to make sure that the student has, in fact, integrated both F and G. So they probably wouldn't lose credit for that. Okay, we have two one? more questions. Yes. Um, Go ahead. One from Rosie. Can you leave the answer with Steinin, not simplified? Yes, absolutely. You can leave a final numerical answer unsimplified. Uh, so in this problem, uh, it would be a little bit difficult to see. Suppose I look at that 4 thirds minus 16 over pi. Look at the expression just to the left of that. I would have a tough time looking at that and knowing that that's negative. But if a student is savvy enough to know that that's negative and then wrote 16 pi minus that expression in the parentheses, that would be okay. That's a final numerical answer. It does not need to be simplified. Kind of hope they'd add or, or take care of the 12 plus 8, but, but that's okay. 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 And the last question is from Jeremy. For area and volume questions, if no specific units are given, should the answer involve the general units squared or units cubed? So here's my rule of thumb. If the problem does not ask for units, I wouldn't worry about it. If the problem does not ask for units, then we're not assigning any points to it. If the problem asks, asks the student to state the units, then there are points associated with it. So in this particular problem, if you take a look at the statement of this problem, it doesn't say anything about writing the units. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay? Okay. That's all that everyone all right. says thank you, and I'll let you know when more come in. Okay, so here we are with reversal issues. So here's what I mean at the top of this page. So let's suppose that the student has made a reversal. So in my weird way of thinking about this, let's suppose they have y low minus y hot. So they've got a reversal. If I sneak back a page, they've got f minus g. Okay, they've made a reversal. Let's suppose they've worked their way all through this, and they leave the answer as negative. If everything else is correct, they'll just simply lose the answer point. So in this particular problem, they get one, to zero, they get three out of four points. Now, one thing that students like to do is they'll get to the end of the problem and they'll say, oh my gosh, the answer is negative. I gotta put absolute values in there somewhere. So there are three common ways that students do this. One way is they go back to the original integral and they slap an absolute value around the entire thing. Now look, that's correct but they would have to carry that absolute value symbol all the way through all of their calculation and end up with an absolute value around their final numerical answer. And I can tell you, I don't know if I've ever seen any student do that. So what frequently happens is they'll throw an absolute value around at the very beginning of the problem, not carry it through, and not finish up, not deal with that negative answer. Another thing that students do is they'll say, oh my gosh, again, the, the answer is negative. I've got to put absolute values in there somewhere, so I'll take the absolute value of the integrand. Well, how do you deal with that? You can't just integrate through that absolute value. You have to determine where that expression inside the absolute value is positive and where it's negative in order to get rid of those absolute values. So I can tell you that any student who does that frequently, I, I mean, frequently doesn't carry it through correctly. And another thing that students try to do is, well, they'll get to the final answer and they say, oh, son of a gun, it's negative, I'll just slap absolute values on there. Well, you can't do that because then the equality is not true. 
So you'll see there's three dots in front of that. If you've done everything with the reversal and you end up with a negative and you just slap absolute values on there, that's not true. So the bottom line here, at least on this page, is I wouldn't go back. I would never recommend to students to just go back and insert absolute value. I would say if you recognize that your answer is negative and you're pretty darn sure you've made a reversal, on a separate line, write that the area is equal to the opposite of that answer. Here's some other things that can go wrong. In the example that I've given you, some students will get to that 4 thirds minus 16 over pi. Remember, they've made a reversal, and they'll recognize that that's negative. And then they'll write, oh, well, that's equal to 16 over pi minus 4 thirds. Well, no, it isn't. That's sort of this stream of consciousness. That's connecting things with equal signs that aren't equal. And so that doesn't get the answer point. That's just wrong. That's bad notation, bad presentation. So here's another thing that happens in a reversal, and I think we've, we've figured out a good way to handle this. So what happens if the student makes an antiderivative error? Well, okay, if they make an antiderivative error, they may be eligible for further points, uh, but they can't have simplified the problem. In other words, there's usually some sort of eligibility criteria. And sort of globally, it's, it's this kind of thing. They can't have changed the complexity of the problem. They can't have made it any easier. So let's suppose in the, our problem that the student has made an antiderivative error in both parts, okay? But they're still eligible. So they got the, they got the first point. They got the integrand point. They've made two antiderivative errors, all right? They made an antiderivative in both cases. So they don't get the middle point. Now, what happens on the last one? Well, if the student actually carries it through, plugs in the 0 to 2 in our case, plugs in the correct bounds, simplifies everything and gets a negative answer, they cannot get the answer point. They're out of it, even if they did everything correctly. Because the student got a negative answer, the student does not know whether that negative answer is due to the reversal are due to the antiderivative point, and unfortunately, they just don't get the answer point. If they are lucky enough when they make an antiderivative error, if they are fortunate enough that when they plug in the bounds, they get a positive value and they've done everything correctly, all the arithmetic, then they can earn the answer point. Now, we've thought an awful lot about this. We think that's fair, at least great consistently. And boy, that's about all I can tell you about reversals. We really thought a lot about this. And again, I think it's pretty fair. Wow. Okay. One more that question, was... Kate Thoreau. Okay, and shoot. Two more, Kate Thoreau. Okay, um, shoot. So the first is from Tony. Regarding the integral setup of washer problems, must the student write one integral with the integrand as PI? As pi parentheses r upper arrow. Yep, I got three. it. Okay, minus r. Okay, so power. so he's asking. He, I think he's asking, do you need one one integral, or can you write it as two? Is that what he's asking? Uh, yeah. The next part of the question is, can they still earn credit for writing the difference of two integrals with the first integrand as pi parentheses yep. r, and then? Yep, I got it. Absolutely. Okay. You don't have to write it as a single integral. You can write it as two. They're, they're equal. They're, they're, that's fine. Most write it as one, but you can write it as two. That's fine. Okay. And then we had another question come through from Jeremy. When evaluating definite integrals and you substitute one of the limits and the answer is zero, do you have to show that work or can you just put zero? No, you can just plug in. You can just show zero. That's fine. You don't have to show that work. I, I, I mean, it would be nice to see something, but if it's clearly zero, no, you don't have to show that. And everyone says thank you. And if you have any more okay. questions, um, guys, just send me a, a chat. Okay. Here are the most common student errors in very general terms. A lot of people ask about one of the most common student errors is what I call, what we call a bald answer. This is an answer without any supporting work where something is expected. 
So, for example, uh, we may ask a student an area or a volume problem on, let's say, the calculator active course of the exam. And I know that your students are so good, they can just reach for their calculator, plug in a couple of things, press a button, and get the answer. Well, they cannot just write that answer down. They have to show the equation, the mathematical equation that led to that answer. So the bottom line is that the student must show their work. Bald answers, at least with this chief reader, rarely get full credit, if any at all. Calculator results without the supporting equation is another common one here. So bald answers are one way that this happens. But there are lots of problems on the calculator active portion of the exam where students have to show us the mathematical equation. For example, if they're solving equation, an equation like f of x equals g of x, they have to tell us what equation they're solving. They have to give us the mathematical expression that yields a calculator result. I understand that under the pressure of this timed exam, sometimes they forget, but we have to know where those numbers come from from. Uh, this one's hard to elaborate on, but in very general terms, uh, we see a lot of insufficient reasons or justification. Uh, I would like to suggest that your students should justify and explain as succinctly as possible. Sometimes we have students that say too much. In other words, they think about, well, you know what, I got a lot I can tell you about this. But you know what, if they tell us too much and they make a mistake in saying something, then they can lose a point that I, they had already earned. And finally, down at the bottom here, uh, especially last year, and I don't know what it was about 2014, but there were an awful lot of, in general, what I call communication errors. And I'm going to lump them into three parts. There were lots of just presentation errors. Last year, there were a lot of parentheses errors and just a lot of mathematical notation errors. If you've looked at the curriculum framework, one of the uh, impacts in there is notational fluency, and that's one of my pet peeves. You know, mathematics has such an elegant language, and we would hope that students would use that precisely and accurately on the AP exam. Lots really of questions. Quick, question. Okay, go ahead. Um, this one is from Rosie. If the student has no idea how to do the problem, but can label it correctly, will they get the unit point if one is given? Oh, that's a good question. In general, the answer to that is no. So if a student has no idea how to, how to do the problem, but units are asked for, if they just say, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I know the units are miles per second, no, we're not going to give them that point, usually. Okay, good question, but no. Okay, decimal presentation errors. So I want to remind you that final numerical answers must be presented with three digits to the right of the decimal. Uh, we've thought an awful lot about this, and we don't know exactly what that means, so we take rounded or truncated. So if you've looked at the standards for the last three years, since I've been chief reader, you'll notice that in some calculator active questions, there are two answers. One is given and another in parentheses. What I tend to do is if the rounded and the truncated values are different, I report the rounded value, and then I report the truncated value in parentheses. And we will take either one of those from the student. So what happens if the student reports additional digits? What if they use 10 digits to the right of the decimal? Well, what we generally do is we only look at the first three of the right of the decimal, and we ignore everything else. They could be right. They could be wrong. Okay, uh, you know, we have to grade 400,000 of these. We're not looking at them. We're only looking at the first three to the right of the decimal. What happens if they give us fewer than three? Or they, may, they, may, uh, they only give us two or they only give us one? Well, we have a phrase that we call inoculation. If a student makes a decimal presentation error, let's say by only giving us two digits to the right of the decimal, then they will be inoculated from any other decimal presentation error on that problem. I wish we could do it on the whole exam, but there just isn't a good way to do that. So if they report, let's say, a final decimal answer to two digits, and then later on they only report a final answer to one digit, they're only going to lose one presentation error. 
And I want to remind you that intermediate results should be scored to the greatest accuracy allowed by your calculator. So if a student has to find a point of intersection, they should score that as to the best accuracy that the machine will allow. You can report that to at least three digits on the paper, and I would suggest that you label it and then use that label in any other calculations on that problem. That's perfectly acceptable. We encourage that. Okay? No questions are coming in. So if anyone has a question, please just send it to me through the chat. Thanks. So this is an interesting one. Are students required to know proofs of theorems for the exam? I had to really think about this. I can't remember a free response question in which a proof was required. I, I've been doing this for almost 28 years. Uh, I can't remember when a proof was required. Maybe some of you have, maybe some of you have been teaching uh, longer than that and may remember a question many, many years ago. Uh, but I don't think we've ever asked for a proof. Um, it certainly helps the student to know proofs. I mean, I think we'd all agree on that one. I can't imagine how we would grade a proof, <laughs> but I don't think we're going to, we, we would ask for one. Are there any plans to make any additional notes regarding the scoring of pre-response questions available for those people who don't attend the reading? That's a good question. Well, the short answer to this is no. Uh, readers, teachers uh, who come to the reading are allowed to take any material they receive at the reading. They're allowed to take that home and use that. However, there is this sort of ETS unwritten policy that any other material at the reading is for internal use only. So there are some other documents that are used at the reading that the table leaders, that leadership has access to. That's very, very specific, uh, that has some very specific examples on it. What do we do in this case? And we just don't make that available to, to anyone. We don't even make that available to traditional, to, to a reader to take home with them. If you're looking for other ways to gain uh, ideas, insights into how we grade the exam, there is a student performance question and answer document that is published every year. Uh, the chief reader writes that. I write that, and it's usually available. I usually get it done within a couple of weeks after the reading, and then I think it's published uh, sometime in early fall. So that's a good source. Besides the standards, that's a good source to gain insights on how we grade. A couple questions came in. Okay. Uh, we have three so far, uh, two so far. The first is from Angie. Do students lose points if they do not include the DX on the Instagram? That's a good question. In general, no, uh, but we probably, we would definitely take a look at the next step to make sure that the student has taken an ENI derivative with respect to X. There are cases where they could lose points. For example, uh, suppose they were setting up some sort of equation that involves a definite integral. Uh, suppose that equation involved like a plus 500, and that plus 500 needs to be outside of the integrand. Well, if there's no dx, and we might we don't know where that 500 belongs. So in general, the student would not lose points for no DX, but there are certainly cases where they would. So my recommendation, darn it, use it. Okay. Um, the next question is from Suzanne. When drawing a particular solution on a slope field, Will the student receive full point value if they go through the initial condition and have the general shape? Yeah, in general, that's correct. Certainly, they have to go through the initial condition, the point on the graph, and we tend to be very liberal in grading those. We're looking for a very general short sort of a shape. Yep. Okay, and so far we have two more. The next is from Jeremy. When integrating a function that results in an inverse trig function with A equaling 1, do you have to show that A equals 1? Uh, okay, if I understand correctly, if the student looks at uh, an integral and looks at that integrand and knows 
that the integral is an inverse trig. They know the form of that. They don't have to show anything about, uh, you know, the denominator or the constant out in front being one. They would not have to do that. If they've got that memorized and they know that's the answer, that would be terrific. Okay. And the last question so far is from Carolyn. So points of intersection can use the approximation to three decimals to the right of the decimal or left to the accuracy of the calculator. Now, when you find that point of intersection, you can report it on your paper to three decimals, but you have to use the greatest degree of accuracy in your machine. So if you find that point of intersection, we suggest that you store that X value in a variable. Uh, what I would tell my students to do is to store that on your calculator and report it to at least three on your paper, but maybe write six. Label it. Label it as a capital A or a capital B or whatever. And then use that label, say, in bounds on a definite interval. Okay. okay. And one more question came through from Sarah. For justification such as because the derivative changes from positive to negative, can students use plus or minus? Basically, are symbols okay? That's a tough one without actually seeing what the student has written. Uh, I would say, I'm going to answer that in two ways. In general, we understand that the plus sign would mean positive and the negative sign would mean negative. And so a student could say that the derivative changes from plus to minus. We get that. So that would be okay. The second part of my answer is remember that sign charts, I'm not sure if you're asking about that, but sign charts are not sufficient. Now in my class, they're okay. But on the, on the AP calculus exam, they're not enough. But I would still have my students construct a sign chart and then write a sentence that interprets that sign chart. I feel that's the best way to do it. You may, you may have better ways, and that's fine. But I think that's a very reasonable, logical way to do it. Okay? Yep. And one more question um, from Rosie. When looking at a first derivative graph, can the student say that the maximum or minimum on the first derivative graph shows that there is an inflection point? Uh, I don't think that would be acceptable. Uh, they would have to say something like the, uh, the sign of F prime changes from positive to negative. Just saying there's a maximum there, we don't uh, probably wouldn't accept that. I can't, I can't remember that coming up. I apologize. But in general, we're looking for you know, the, the, some sort of uh, relationship justification back to F prime or something about F double prime if you're, we're talking about points of inflection. And okay. uh, what, one last question from Tony. On slope fields, the solution curve must be continuous and differentiable. If a student draws the negative branch of a parabola opening to the right, Will they still earn credit if they include the point of the vertex, although the derivative would be undefined at that point? I'm not sure if I can answer that one for you. I would, I would suggest that we're not going to give a problem on the free response portion. We're not going to give a question that's going to make the student worry about something like that. So we're not going to worry. We're not going to have the student draw a particular solution. Uh, over only one branch like that where they might have to cross over or well, they wouldn't cross over, but we're probably not going to ask the student to do that. Now, they do have to be careful in drawing slope fields. You are right about this. You do have to be careful in drawing a particular solution in a slope field if, for example, the, the uh, function is undefined at some point. But I can't recall a question like that that we've given on the free response. So I, I, I wouldn't worry about that one. Okay? Okay, and it seems we have a pause in question. So, oh, one more came through. Um, 
from Sarah. There is a point of inflection where the first derivative changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Would that be sufficient? That would be wonderful. There's a point of inflection at x equals 5 because on the graph, that prime changes sign from positive to negative. That would be wonderful. And one more question. Any tips on how students should be preparing for the multiple choice portion of the exam? How should they be preparing? Uh, how, they, how they should prepare, yeah. Well, I don't know how to answer that one. You know, there, haven't been, there hasn't been an officially released exam in a while. However, uh, those of you, uh, those of you who have, those of you who have passed the audit, you have access to at least three international exams. And the international exam is released every year, has been for the last three years, and will continue to be. It's been released to audit teachers, and that's both the multiple choice and the free response. So there's three multiple choice exams that you could practice with. I think that would be a great source. Okay. Uh, okay. Yep. Here we, we go. are. No more questions as of now, so I'll let you. Start. All right. Are there any plans to allow other types of technology on the AP Calculus exam? Boy, you know what? We've thought a lot about this. And as far as I know, I've been, I just came back from a development committee meeting. There's none that I know of. I think there are lots of people, I hope there are lots of people thinking about this issue at both the College Board and EPS. Uh, I, I can tell you that I'm a little bit bothered by the four calculator functions because those four calculator functions have been around for, what, 20, 25 years, and we haven't changed anything. Those are the only important skills. Uh, I, I think something's got to change soon. Uh, I mean, technology has changed dramatically over the last two decades, so I think something's got to change, but I don't know of any plan. Uh, people ask me about, well, you know, what about people, what about students who are using a CAS machine? Don't they have an advantage? Well, I can tell you that we think very carefully about this when we write questions. And we're very careful to write calculator active questions so that students with a CAS machine do not have any advantage. So that uh, brings up. Whoop, uh, go ahead. Uh, one more question came in from Ashley. Would a student be counted off for saying the wrong variable on a free response? For instance, on a contextual problem using x for distance instead of t for time, if a student said at t equals 5 when they meant x equals 5. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, the answer to that is they'd probably get credit. They probably would receive credit, but it depends upon whether or not there are other variables floating around in the problem. Uh, you know, whether there's a g of x defined or something like that. If there are both x's and t's, well, uh, not so clear. But in general, we would we would give the student the benefit of the doubt. Okay, um, one more question from Kim. The general rule has been no bonus for simplifying on the free response question. How does That's that right. Fit, how does this fit in? How does that fit in the case of the power theory question? Our students. How does that fit in with with what? Uh, a, power, a, a power series question. With a power series question? Yeah, are uh, students required uh, to simplify the terms of the series to make it clear oh, that it oh, is a power okay. series That's, multiplying the term? Yep, I got it. No, they don't have to simplify that. In other words, if it, if it was something like four thirds times x to the third over three factorial, no, they don't have to simplify that. That's not really numerical, I understand, but but no, they don't have to simplify that either. That's a good question. Now, they may um, one need more. to. But, but they don't have to. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, one more question. May the student use the function names in the mathematical setup instead of the equation itself and still earn full credit? That is an absolutely superb question, and the answer to that is yes, and we advise them to do that. So that if a function is named in the problem, if we say this is f of x and this is g of x, then we recommend that the student use those names in solving out in any part. And in fact, if it's a calculator active question, we recommend that the student immediately put that into their calculator. 
like for Y1 or Y2, or if they're using a CAS machine, use the exact symbols, F and G. Yep, you can absolutely use those names in solving problems. And in fact, if in the course of solving a problem, if a student writes a name function, like A of X is equal to F of X minus G of X, they can use that A in solving the problem. Absolutely. We recommend that because uh, that tends to avoid a lot of parentheses issues. Okay. Uh, that was the last question so far, so I'll let you continue. Okay. Here we go. I got 10 very quick calculator reminders. We are just talking about calculators. Remind your students to set their calculator for radian mode. Even though we've been doing this for years and years, we still have students who come into the exam and have their calculator set in degree mode, and they can lose a lot of points very easily. I just want to remind you of the important required skills. Remember graphing in an appropriate window, finding the zero of a function of solving an equation, and numerically calculating the derivative of a function at a value, and calculating the value of a definite integral numerically. So you must be able to do that. Look, you can use your calculator for other stuff, and we encourage that. But you cannot use your calculator for other things and use that as justification in a problem. You can only use these four things as justification. Uh, I've already talked about this one, but I'll remind you again, show the mathematical equation that led to the calculator results. Remember three digits to the right of the decimal and avoid any intermediate rounding. We talked about that one. I got a couple more. Somebody just asked about this one, so remember to define and store functions in the calculator. That just makes it much easier, more accurate, less prone to error. Uh, lots of parentheses errors last year, so we encourage students to take advantage of math print. I think that's a feature on many calculators. Uh, we've talked about this one, store important values in a variable, use the variable in subsequent calculations. That's perfectly acceptable. We encourage students to do that. Remember to maintain accuracy. Here's a couple ways that students sometimes lose accuracy. Suppose they're trying to find a point of intersection. Some students will actually go to their graph, graph screen and use the trace feature. Remember that that is not very accurate. They should find the point of intersection in one of two ways, either on the graph screen by using the intersection command. But we suggest that they actually do that on the home screen with an equation. And the reason is that on some machines, perhaps older machines, perhaps older operating systems, the graph screen calculations may not be as accurate as home screen calculations. So my rule of thumb is that I always explore on the graph screen and say, oh, I think there's a point of intersection between 2 and x equal 2 and 3. Now I'm going to go to the home screen. I'm going to find that point of intersection using an equation. And I'm going to store that x value in a variable. Remember, the justifications require mathematical arguments, not a calculator one. Student can't just say, well, you know, I looked at my calculator, I looked at this graph, and so it must be true. A graph is never sufficient as an argument on a free response question. And finally, down at the bottom here, remind your students to use standard mathematical notation. So if they're writing a definite integral, they have to use mathematical notation. They can't use something like F int. They won't get credit for that. So here's a good one. In a Riemann sum problem, is function notation necessary or are the values sufficient? This is a good question, and I'm going to show you an example of this one. The shorter answer is, in general, function notation is not necessary. However, if the student uses function notation using a, a function that's given in the problem, they may very quickly earn the first point in this kind of a problem, and I'll try to show you an example of this. So this is from 2012. This was AD1, BC1. You may remember this one. Here we have water in a tub, and it's being heated, I believe. And I'm going to focus in on part C. We have a table up there, and it's specific values of time t. We have some values of w, and we want the student to use a left Riemann sum with four subintervals to approximate that average value. And then we want to know whether that's an over overestimate or an underestimate. So take a look at the standard here. So in general, in these types of problems, the first point is a conceptual problem. 
first point is for the student being able to convey to us that they know what a left Riemann sum is. In this particular problem, since there are four subintervals, we have a seven out of eight rule. So there are eight things that we're really looking for. In this case, the four times W is zero, five times W is four, and so forth. So in order for the student to get that conceptual point, we want to see seven out of eight of those items, those expressions, correct. So that first line in that solution would earn that conceptual point. So there's a case where the student has used function notation and earned the first point. What if that first line weren't there? Well, suppose those, that line with the Ws wasn't there, but the student started with 120 to 4 times 55. That's worth one point. That's the conceptual point. And in fact, if all the student did was write that line, 120 at 4 times 55 plus 5 times 57.1 and so forth, that's worth the first two points. Not only is that the conceptual point of the left free run sum, but that's also the approximation. It's a numerical answer and it doesn't have to be simplified. And in this particular problem, the third point was for the student telling us an underest it is an underestimate with a reason. Down at the bottom where I have notes, that second bulleted item is to remind you that sometimes in these problems, we ask the student to find an approximation and then we ask them to interpret it. When we ask them to interpret this kind of a, a, an integral, a definite integral in context, I want to remind you that we are generally looking for units and we want to make sure that the student tells us there's the right interval, that this isn't happening at one specific time point that this is over an interval. I remind you again about simplification. In my class, I want my students to do that, but on the AP exam, they don't have to. We already looked at this problem, but I would encourage you to go back and take a look at the two train problems from last year. There was a problem like this. Uh, there was a Riemann sum problem, and if you take a look at the standard, you'll see something similar on the right-hand side. Uh, this was kind of a tough one for me to answer, but I'll do the best that I can. In a problem involving... Um, we have one more question come in before we move okay, on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, regarding separation of variables, if a point is awarded for the constant of integration, is that point earned by writing plus C, or are they expected to write plus C and solve correctly for that constant based on their equation? In other words, if they just write plus C, do they earn the point? If they write the plus C in the correct place, right after they take the derivative of both sides, they earn one point. So they don't have to solve for C to earn that point. That solving for C is wrapped up in the answer point. The plus C is for knowing that there is a constant and putting it in the right place. Okay, thank you. Okay. So in the volume of a solid of revolution, if either the constant or the limits of integration are wrong, can the student receive credit? Really quick, for sorry, we had a, a follow-up to the that question. Um, does the plus C have to be on both sides? No, it does not. One side is sufficient, and if you take a look at the standards, that's the way we write the solution. Okay, and then we just had two more questions come in. Okay. Um, the first is from Ashley. On a differential equation, does using the initial value just mean plugging in the correct x and y values? That is correct. So frequently on those problems, we have one point for the plus c, constant of integration, and one point for using the initial condition for plugging in the uh, x, correct x value, the correct y value. And again, all the simplification is wrapped up in the answer point. And then the last question is from Jeannie. When interrupting an average value using a table, must students refer to the interval or can they just use the time in the explanation? Uh, well, I'm not sure I can answer that one. Uh, if they're interpreting an average value, I would say in general they have to refer to the interval and they have to, re and, and we probably ask them for the units. 
So I'm not sure if that's that's sufficient for an answer, but I think that's the best I can do. Okay, thank you. Okay, here we go. So let's suppose in a volume of a solid or revolution problem, the student has made a constant error, which means they, they lost the pi or they put a square root of three out there, or they made an error in the limits on the definite interval. Now, look, these are, this is just very general, and it doesn't always hold. You'll see I have the word may in here. But let's suppose they've made an error in the constant or the limits. The word that the on my slide is in bold, which means if the student produces the correct answer, it is possible that they would receive some credit. It depends. We could interpret that as a presentation error. If it were a calculator active question, you know, and the answer is 12.345, that's the only way they're going to get that, we would assume perhaps under the pressure of an exam that the student wrote 0 to 3 rather than 0 to 2, but plugged in the right two into their calculator. They might get credit, but not all the time. If, however, the student has made a constant or a limit error, and they have the correct answer for their setup, in other words, they've actually integrated 0 to 3 rather than 0 to 2, it is very unlikely that they would get any credit, even if they have the correct answer. Now, again, that's very general. It depends on what kind of a problem it is. If it's non-calculator and the student has not changed the complexity of the problem by, by changing those bounds, we might read with them. So that's a difficult question to answer without looking at a very specific problem. And finally, my last slide here, Nicole. I'd like to encourage all of you, I'd like to encourage all of you to think about becoming a reader. Is probably the best professional development experience I think you will ever have. Uh, the applications for AP Calculus readers just opened up again last fall. It has been closed for almost four years. So you have a wonderful opportunity to get your name on the list. I can tell you that there were about 30 or 40 people who applied over this past academic year since October, went through the process and got approved, and they are all coming to the reading in June. There is currently no backlog. Now, if you applied tonight, you wouldn't get to the reading this year probably, but I would like to encourage all of you to consider becoming a reader. You can go to AP Central. Uh, there's an icon on the left-hand side where it says become an AP reader. You click on that, you'll have to fill out a couple of forms, you'll have to submit your resume, and you'll have to submit your syllabus for your course. Fantastic. Great. Any other last questions, Nicole? Um, nothing has come through, but oh, there's one that just came through from Molly. Um, if a student separates their variables correctly but integrates one side incorrectly, will they get the answer point provided they do the rest of the steps correctly? Uh, short answer to that is it's unlikely. Uh, if you make uh, if you integrate both sides and you make a mistake on one side, uh, usually you're not eligible for the answer point. You may get the plus C point, you may get the initial value point, but you won't get the answer point. 